Hello, you are listening to Second City Sermons, a ministry of Second City Church in Midtown Harrisburg. From now to the end of April, we are going to be in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to journey with the disciples up to the cross on Good Friday, and then from there, the Easter narratives of Luke, some of the most beautiful stories in Scripture. We hope you can join us maybe here online on this podcast, or even better in person. We'd we'd love to meet you. So we hope you'd consider joining with us on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. right here in the heart of Midtown Harrisburg. You can also find us online at secondcitychurch.org and on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We hope you enjoy this sermon. God bless. Lord, um, we have uh, your holy word before us and uh, a long passage and one that has been debated a great deal, and there's a great deal of confusion and wondering and lots of papers written about. God, we pray this morning uh, that you would speak to us where we are. Or do we come to you this morning from so many different places, uh, places of great confidence in you and sometimes places of great questioning you and, and uh, places of great faith and sometimes great doubt and um, our weeks have been so different and Yet we're, we're here, Lord, uh, we're seated and we're, we're listening and we pray that you'd speak. God, teach us, please, this morning. Amen. Okay, I mentioned that we are uh, in the season of Epiphany, which is often considered um, you know, beginning uh, January 6th for various reasons. I won't go into all this today. Is often the time when we celebrate the Magi coming, the wise men, the magicians, right? Uh, coming uh, and and worshiping Jesus there in the manger or the Christ child. We think he was likely a little bit older, of course, because of Herod's desire to execute all the kids too and younger later on. Um, But we're in this season, and what has typically been observed in this season is this reflection on this reality that God reveals himself to the whole world in Jesus, right? The people that are far off come and worship him, and he's revealed to them. Um, and so what we've done typically as a church is we have spent this time in the gospel texts, um, looking specifically and saying, Jesus, reveal yourself to us. And what we've actually done um, is we have spent every single season around this time since I've been here, and this is the ninth time uh, year that I've been here, uh, in the gospel of Luke. Okay, so we're back in the gospel of Luke, and I will say this, we are actually going to finish it this year. That's amazing. Okay, it's going to be, uh, but we are going to be in it through to the end of April. And I, actually, in God's kind providence, it's going to follow very well, sort of leading up to the cross, and then we're going to be taught in the resurrection the weeks following Easter. It's going to be, it's going to work out remarkably well. And you would think I planned it that way. I kind of did, but not quite. Um, today, we have a really long passage before us. Um, some of this some people call this passage the Olivet Discourse. You can find it, of course, in the other synoptic gospels, which are Mark and Matthew. And you could break this up. Some people do break this up in commentaries. But a lot of people say this is one discourse that Jesus is giving. And there's really one main point that's happening here. Um, and you can, let me just show you, in a way, how you can kind of put that together. Verse 5 um, says, and while some, some were speaking of the temple, right? So it begins with this uh, interaction with the temple, and then down at the end, verse 37 and verse 38, and every day he was teaching in the temple. Verse 37, and early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple. And so it's sort of giving what, in the literary term, you call this an inclusio, a beginning and an end, something that encloses what's taking place, and that means you're supposed to take it all together. Okay, so what that means, though, this morning is that we've got a really long passage that's both very confusing, and lots of people have written about it and debated about it and all this, and I'm going to give one sermon on it, okay? And you know that this sometimes happens. That means I'm not going to get to speak to all the details that I sometimes get to speak to and other times gloss over. This is going to be one of those glossy texts. Okay, I want to begin by telling you the main point of this passage, right? Sometimes I build into the main point. I just want to tell it to you right here. Keep watch and stay awake. Namely, keep watch for God and what he's doing. And do not fall asleep to the Lord. Don't give up on faith. Keep going. Stay awake. Um, 
Now, Jesus gives us quite a bit, of course, saying that. We're going to get into that a little bit, but first I want to talk to you about a Bluey episode. Some of you uh, likely watch Bluey. All of you should. It is an animated show from Australia that uh, follows a dog family, specifically a breed called uh, Blue Healers. That's an Australian cattle dog. Um, and then the other families are made up of different you know, types of dogs and stuff. It's awesome. Uh, and the show mostly follows Bluey, who is um, a personification or like a, a what do you, an anthropomorphization of a dog who's a little child who's six years old. And her family, her little sister is named Bingo, and her parents, her mom and her dad. Um, truly, it's amazing, and you should all watch it, no matter how old you are. It's really, really good. Um, and for Bluey fans, you're really excited right now, as am I, because new episodes came out on Friday. Can I get an amen? Um, so there's this episode of Bluey, which is not one of the new ones, um, called Sleepy Time. And my uh, children and I watched this, actually, Lily and I watched it a couple times this week. Um, and one of the reasons why it is so good is because every parent can relate to this episode. Um, it follows... Uh, Sleepy time for Bingo, the younger sister dog. Um, and she's being put to bed. And, she, you know, she has stuff like this, like her stuffed, stuffed bunny, the little stuffy, is, you know, falls out and it's on the ground. And, you know, she has, the mom has to pick it up and put it in. And so you relate in that kind of level, but on a much more intense level, you relate to this episode. Because the mom initially at the beginning of the episode reads this book to Bingo and then she's done. She's like, oh, time to go to bed. And Bingo miraculously just has another book under her pillow. It's like, I need another book, you know. And um, so, she's, so she's read this second book. And as soon as she falls asleep, she begins to dream about outer space, okay. Um, because that was the subject of the second book that was read. The last thing that she heard was about outer space. And so she starts to dream about outer space. Well, um, Okay, through the course of this episode, she starts uh, sleepwalking. And of course, she sleepwalks into her parents' room. And of course, what happens is that she, you know, she gets in there and she snuggles in between them. And then the mom gets annoyed and the mom goes and sleeps in her bed. And then Bluey, her older sister, comes in. And then she's like jumping in outer space. But in fact, what she's doing is kicking her dad, you know, who is like grunting and like trying to stay asleep, but he's not really asleep, but he's kind of asleep. And the dad sort of wakes up and brings uh, Bingo back to her bed. But then he's like sort of sleepwalking and goes to the bathroom. And then Bingo gets up and then goes back to, the, to his bed. And then he goes back. Oh, my goodness. There's no sleeping that takes place. I mean, it's like, except Bingo's dead asleep, right? And here, okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it. But here, here's this episode. And it is just so sad. And it's so funny because it is exactly my life. Like, I know exactly that it's exactly what is happening in this, you know? That, I mean, Melissa and I have lived that night. I have no idea. Countless, countless times, you know? Uh, but here's the other thing. I'm, I'm watching this episode, and I'm, like, and I'm studying this passage, you know? And I'm like, gosh, this is so similar to this passage. And I know you're scratching your heads going, that's weird. That's stretching it, but... But actually, I, I think it's not too distant, okay? Um, uh, we are all, in, so everybody in this, in this episode is either asleep or they want to be asleep, right? Um, and, I don't, and, and, and I think a lot of times what, 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 what Jesus is saying is there's a great temptation for all of us, not just physically, but spiritually to fall asleep to God. And actually even maybe to desire to do that. To be distant, right? To, he says, watch out. Be careful. Don't fall asleep. And I know you're going to be tempted to, be, to, okay? I think that's what Jesus is getting at here. Uh, verse 34, Jesus gives us actually a couple uh, reasons why this is the case, okay? And we're just going to mostly consider those reasons this morning. Okay, this is what verse 34 says. But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness, and cares of this life. Of course, verse 36 then tells us this, but stay awake at all times. Stay awake at all times. So two things, okay? 
He says we can fall asleep to God because of the good gifts of life and because of the bad times of life. Okay. So the first point I want to say is uh, we can actually become asleep to God because of the good. Um, so, so let's get back to Bluey, the Bluey episode, right? Bingo in this episode, which is called Sleepy Time, um, is so overtaken by this story that her mom had just read to her that immediately after she falls asleep, you know, the, the camera and the animation pans over to the book that's on the ground with the earth clearly in outer space, and then it focuses in, and then you, you, you get the sense that you're in outer space, and then bingo bursts out of the earth. It cracks, and she flies into outer space. And um, she starts floating, and then the next thing that happens is there's the moon there, and the moon begins to crack, and her fluffy bunny cracks out, and it's just so joyful, and playful, and they start bouncing around in outer space, and then you, 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 you know, you, you, uh, it shows the room, and then Bingo starts doing this out of her room into the hallway of her house, and she's slowly floating towards her parents to wreak havoc on her dad. Um, but, okay, here's, here's the thing that I'm getting at here. She's actually asleep in part because of the beauty of this world. And the wonder of this book that her mom read to her. And just the joy of having a parent that will read to her. And things like that. You know, there's something good that actually puts her into this deep sleep that she then becomes this playful person in. He says, keep watch. Because of dissipation. Which dissipation can mean the breaking up of something, but you probably also know that it means excessive pursuit of pleasure. Excessive interest in the good things says dissipation and drunkenness and overindulgence in something that God has given to us for our good and for our enjoyment. That's why it's connected there in verse 34, dissipation with something that could be good that leads to something bad. Dissipation and drunkenness. An excessive pursuit of pleasure. Um, okay, so think about this. How did this passage begin? This long passage, if you remember, verse 5, it begins like this. Okay. I'm going to read verse 5 and 6. And while some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, he said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Um, and this whole long discourse of Jesus that I've said Ends with this idea, keep watch and stay awake. It begins with these people, you know, they're around the temple. Jesus is teaching around the temple like it tells us there at the end in 37 and 38. Um, and the people are just going, oh, man, look how beautiful this is. You know, we've been blessed with this space and it's just so amazing. It's been adorned with stones and so great. carved, ornate carvings. When Melissa and I were um, getting married, we, you know, registered for things. And there was this woman asking us if we were going to um, register for draperies. She said it like that. And I just picture these people looking around the temple and going, oh, look at the draperies. And here's what's happening, of course, right? They're actually missing Jesus, who's God in the flesh, because they're so overwhelmed with actually something that's really good, the temple and how beautiful it is. Right? They're actually falling asleep to God, even from the good things that he gives us, the beauty of this world. I mean, it's like their obsession with the temple, which for a thousand years had been this place where God's presence had been with them. I know about the exile, but you know, for this long, this has been the symbol of God's presence with them. They're so consumed with that that they actually miss Jesus in front of them. And Jesus, of course, tells us on his fam- in his famous Sermon on the Mount, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. But where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
Jesus acknowledges that there's actually good things on this earth. I mean, God made them. They are good. They're for our enjoyment. But he says, where is your heart? And the fact is, is that sometimes it's the very good things that we are given in this life that actually cause us to fall asleep to our Lord. We can be asleep to God because of the very good things. We can store up good things in our hearts that actually distract us from seeing God. Parents, let's all acknowledge this. Uh, One of the great temptations of parenting is that your kids become the main thing. Right? And so, of course, how this works out is uh, your kids' sports become the main thing that distract you and and cause you to neglect regular worship in God's house and the devotion to him. And, And this good thing that all over Scripture said this is a blessing can become the very thing that actually distracts you from devotion to our Lord and seeing him and being with him. So I'm saying that one of the things that Jesus is saying, the big thing Jesus is saying here is keep watch, stay awake, be present to the Lord. And he's saying there's a temptation. And the first temptation is for the good things. Now, that's not the main focus of the passage, though. The main focus of the passage is actually most of us will fall asleep to God because of the bad things, because of the difficult times because of the hardships that we will experience in life. Um, and actually, I think this connects with Bluey too. Indulge me a little bit, okay? The, the most difficult thing about this passage is actually what you don't see. Um, what I mean by that. So the dad's name is Bandit. Um, and he is kicked all night long, you know, by his children. Because Bingo begins it, and then once, his, once the mom dog goes to sleep in Bingo's room, then Bluey gets in, and they're both just, like, laying down. Like, I mean, like, you know, mom, dad's right here, and first Bingo's, like, right here, and he's just doing, he's literally just doing this. And then the next scene, you see, like, Bluey right next to him, just kicking him and kicking him and kicking him. It's so awful. Um... But anyway, um, here's what's so awful, right? So, so the dad can't really sleep, and you get this sense that he can't really sleep because he goes to the bathroom, and he doesn't even notice his own child walked by because he's, he's awake, but he's not awake, right? And then what's really awful is that you know that actually persisted the whole next day because a lot of times, actually, the bad things that we experience in life do cause us to fall asleep very deeply, right? Right? very deeply to God. We fall asleep to the reality of God. Um, And that's partly because we really have been kicked time and time again. We go, why is this happening? What is going on? And I think this is really what Jesus is primarily warning people about here. Let me me tell you some of the reasons why I think this is the case. Okay, first, Jesus says that uh, the temple is going to be destroyed. Verse 6 says, as for these things that you see, the days will come when, when uh, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And then the response from the people that are there with him, they're like, oh, wait, when's this going to happen? You know? Uh, and then actually, this is kind of interesting. He does begin to tell them a little bit of things to look for later. But, but the second thing he says is another hardship that they're going to experience, right? He says, Oh, let me, well, let's talk about that later. He says this, uh, verse 7, or sorry, verse 8. See that you're not led astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. Which is to say, another hardship that you're pro- very possibly going to experience as a follower of God is actually false teachers and false religion. And people pr- uh, presenting Jesus to you in a fake way, in an unreal way, and actually religion that's going to harm your faith in a way. You you possibly might fall asleep to God because of, because of real difficulty within the life of the church, is what he's saying. Okay. Um, the third thing he says, there's going to be wars and natural disasters, verses 10 and 11. Um, nation will rise up again, nation, king, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be great earthquakes and in various places, famines and pestilences. And there'll be terrors and great signs from heaven. He says... The part, of, part of the possibility of not staying awake to God or falling asleep to God is the real fact that there are wars in this world. 
and there's rumors of wars, and there's destruction, and there is, we live in a world, and I, I, my guess is all of us are feeling this right now. I mean, with, you know, stuff that's going on with the Houthis, and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and this, and that, and that, and maybe just conflicts on your own street, and in your own home, and you're like, why? What's going on? He keeps going. He actually says, fourth, that you're going to receive persecution as Christians. Now, some of what he says here pertains to the, the, the time, okay? Very concretely, the time. You know, he says that you're going to be brought before synagogues. Meaning, like, your, your religious community and your social community is actually going to um, kick you out because you're going to follow Jesus. So, there's, you know, some of that that he's talking about is really contextualized within the time. But, um, but he says this, right? Uh, verse 12, but before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. And you will be brought before kings and governors for my, my name's sake. Now, okay, uh, fifth, fifth. He actually says, some of you are going to fall asleep because your own family will not love you through this. They will not stick with you when you worship me, when you follow me. Um, verse, um, we're going to skip down, verse 16. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. Okay, we can keep going on. I could go into a little more of the details here. But um, what I'm saying is that he, Jesus is saying that there are certain things that are going to happen because you are following him and you're, you're walking with God and that walking with him is going to create such a situation at times where you're going to say, I don't think I want to keep watch for God. I don't want to be attentive to him. I'm going to fall asleep to God. He's going to be a distant memory. I'm going to give up. And he's saying, don't do it. Um, and think about this, right? It's true. Some of, some of us will be tempted, some, probably all of us will be tempted to fall asleep to God in a way because of the things that we love that are good. You know? um, but many of us will fall asleep to God or be tempted to because of these very reasons that Jesus mentions. Okay? Um, because of religion itself. Because of false teachers that have harmfully lied to us about God and his ways. Um, some of us will fall asleep to God because we look out on the world and we see actually the, the horrendous natural disasters that take place and the extent of war, and we really do go, wait, wait, I worship a God who is love, we studied this fall in 1 John, and who is so great and so powerful that he speaks and the world comes into being. What is going on? That is going to be, be a temptation. Uh, where is God in the midst of all of this? Um, some of us are going to fall asleep to God, or at least you will probably be tempted to. Um, because you hate the feeling of telling someone you're a Christian only to be dismissed or laughed at or mocked. Do you really believe a man was God long ago, dying on a cross and rising to new life? Do you believe the Bible? Um, some of us, We'll fall asleep to God because our, our parents think we are silly and immature for following Jesus. Some of us, because our friends think we are delusional for following Jesus. And some of us, because our children think we are following some antiquated, outdated ideas, God, not keeping up with the times. Jesus is simply naming these things. Now, the next section, and of course it's woven through this previous section too, um, does talk, I think, more specifically about this destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which took place actually during the Jewish-Roman wars, and specifically took place in AD 70, okay? Jesus is actually speaking to historical events in a way, particularly that next uh, paragraph of this verse 20 to 24. Um, I mean, the, the, the let me give you an example. The description, the, some of the descriptions that he says, literally, we just know happened. Like verse 21 says, um, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. 
and let those who are in the city depart. That, like, people fled from Jerusalem, and people specifically fled to mountainous areas where they could hide. I was actually reading this week that we, we think that a lot of the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in the Qumran community happened specifically because they were following Jesus' words right here. You know, they were leaving Jerusalem with the sacred texts when it was being destroyed by the Romans, and they fled to the Qumran community in the dead, you know, near the Dead Sea where, the, where it's mountainous and where you could hide in caves. We, so we know like some of this is actually taking place. Okay. Um, but, the, but then the next section, the next paragraph seems, seems to also speak to this idea that, that there's an end time that's going to happen. Okay. Some of you know this discussion in the book of Revelation and some of these other texts that how much, how much of the future telling has taken place around, you know, 80, 70, and how much the future place is taking place in the future, whatever, for us. Did y'all follow that? Okay, you, you sort of follow that. Like, future was funny there. Um, I think Jesus' main point, though, is very, very clear. Because the temptation for a Christian living in Jerusalem when those things were taking place was, oh my goodness, God worked in the temple for so long. Oh my goodness, Jerusalem is the center of faith. And what is happening when literally some of our own family members are being killed by Romans? Are you not going to question the goodness of God in that moment? You very likely will. Will you possibly fall asleep to the presence of God? You're sure going to be tempted to. And frankly, what's so important about this is these things are distant, but they are so real. They're so real. I know multiple people on both sides of the political spectrum over the last two election years that left Christianity when the elections took place. All right? Because there's temptations all around us to fall asleep to God. To say, I don't think I want to keep watch for him. When is he coming? When is he going to make good on his promises? When the world around me seems just crazy. You get the idea. saying, stay awake, keep watch. Brothers and sisters, these are not wild uh, thoughts for Jesus to speak um, to those who were listening to him at that time. I mean, they, they really, really weren't. Think about, I know this is kind of funny because sometimes we jump in and out of Luke like this or some other te- text, you know, and, and you're, you're not always remembering the context. And frankly, I'm not always too, so I have to go back and study it. Like what exactly happened right before and what's happening Afterwards, and this passage happens, you know, after the triumphal entry of Jesus, where you you remember, you know, great crowds were following him and laying their coats before him and palm branches before him and saying, Hosanna, you know, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And what will happen in the next chapter is his own, one of his own disciples is going to just take some money to betray him. And what's going to happen also is that actually all of his disciples are going to leave him when things get hard. Like, you know, Jesus is there, you know, going through the pain of Calvary essentially by himself. I know that there's a, there's a time on the cross where John is there and his mother is there. But for the most part, this idea that Jesus, you're, you're allowing this kind of suffering to happen even to you. I don't know. I think I'll fall asleep to God. I don't know. Maybe I won't keep watch. He's saying, stay awake. Stay awake. Don't give in to the good things in life or don't give in to just how horrendous this world can be at times. The pain of this life, which is very, very real. Don't let those things draw you away from the Lord, from watching for him, from being attentive to him. And we know that it was through the cross that came new life. You know, this event that was this most horrendous event. This, this one who had done nothing wrong is hanging on the cross. And it's through that experience where Jesus himself even says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That new life comes into the world. I mean, we may question what God is doing, you know, allowing these Romans to come in and destroy the very temple, the holy city. Allowing natural disasters and wars, um, a country, at least our country, that is unbelievably politically divided, that divides family, families that claim to worship Jesus but can't talk to each other. You know, 
all these things that cause us to question and to wonder. Jesus is saying, be attentive. God will show up. He will ultimately show up on the great judgment day when he makes all things new. But he is at work and he's present and he's not absent to any of it. None of it's lost on him. I mean, sorrow may last for the night and the night may be very long. But joy comes in the morning, the scriptures tell us. Keep watch and stay awake. Amos told us, prepare to meet your God because he's coming. John the Baptist said, flee from the wrath to come. It's coming. Paul said, may you find mercy from the Lord on that day because he's coming. Jesus tell us, tells us, be always on the watch and pray. Stay awake. Keep watch. Do not give up on the Lord. Let me pray. Lord, how true is it that we can fail to be eager for you, attentive to you, devoted to you, because we are distracted by the delights of this world, good gifts from you. And how true is it that many, many Christians throughout time have stopped following you because of the horrendous things in this world, in this life. Lord, we confess this morning that these are temptations that are known to us. And God, we lay them before you. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you name them. And God, we pray that we would hear your words, heed your words to us this morning. And that we, we would be a people that keep watch, and that we stay awake, and that we're eager for you. God, that this year we would devote ourselves to following you more and more, listening to your words spoken in your word. Your word. God, that this year we would not fall into the great temptation that will be a temptation all around us um, to maybe give up on you because of all of the great division and heartache and hatred that will be spoken of and enacted in this year. God, hold us fast. Thank you for listening to Second City Sermons podcast. We hope this sermon has encouraged you to worship God and to celebrate the gospel of Jesus. Please consider subscribing to this podcast and joining us in person each Sunday at 10 a.m. You can find us online at secondcitychurch.org and on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Thanks again for listening. God bless.